Hi everyone and welcome to week 11. This week we are going to be talking about data visualizations and making better use of data for decisions, some resources and tools to assist with visualizations, and some examples of good and bad visualizations. So to start with, what are data visualizations? Data visualization is a way that we can show the data and the information that we have to others. There's a whole bunch of different ways that we could do this. We could do things like pie charts or bar graphs, but we could also do things like infographics or animations. Um, if you spend any time online, you've probably seen a lot of the infographics. Those tend to be really popular on social media because you can share a large amount of data with someone or a lot of someone's in a very compelling way relatively quickly. When you have data visualizations, your goal is to try to present your data in a way that somebody else can understand at a glance. You want them to be able to pick up the important points and sort of see the goal that you're aiming for really quickly. Most people do prefer data visualizations to raw data because it's a lot easier to understand the you know raw data or just putting numbers on a screen. For a lot of people that makes it really difficult for them to understand. Um, but for people that you know if you want to share your data with them doing it in a visual way can really help that. So if we do data visualizations well, we can communicate our data with others better. It's easier to see patterns if we can visualize the patterns. So for most people, um, being able to see a pattern in just a list of numbers is actually relatively difficult. But if we can show them the pattern in such a way that it's a little bit more clear, it makes it easier. So showing the patterns can help show the data analysis work or just the data in ways that our numbers really can't show the same. There's lots of different ways we can show data. There's charts, there's graphs, there's plots. However, and this is important, the type of data and what you're trying to show and who you're trying to share it with is going to dictate the type of data visualization that you want to do. There isn't going to be one data visualization that is going to be the correct choice for every single situation, every single scenario. Now, one of the reasons that I mention this is because it's really easy to sort of say like, oh, well, now that I know how to do a pie chart or a bar graph or whatever, it's really easy to be like, well, now that I can do that, I'll do that everywhere. You know, um, everything, there's the like, you know, nail hammer um, saying that a lot of people have. And it's important that you think about what you're trying to show to others and think about the best way to do that. Now, there's actually a whole industry of people that will spend a lot of time and effort and energy trying to show data visualizations and show them in the best way possible. Um, the example that the person that's the example that I'm going to use is Edward Tuft because they've actually been an expert in the field of data visualizations for quite a while. They've done several books. Um, I went to one of their uh, conferences several years ago um, and they as long as we're not talking about websites the websites are a different ball of wax but for data visualizations they are an expert in the field so to create a good visualization and to judge if it's a good visualization we're going to look at excellence integrity maximizing the data ink ratio and aesthetic elegance. These are the criteria that you'll see Tuft using. Um, th th he'll do a little bit of other criteria and explain this a little bit more. Um, this will obviously also be linked on my website or Blackboard, depending on which one you're looking at. But the idea is that we're trying to look at the visualizations critically so that we can figure out if it's a good one or a bad one. So first we want to make sure that our visualization is offering the most bang for the buck. Don't make it more complex than it, than it needs to be. You want your visualization to show 
easily and quickly at a glance whatever you're trying to communicate with somebody else. So when we say excellence, it's really just have you looked at your visualization? Is there anything sort of extraneous in there that you could pull out? Simplistic is going to be better. Um, second, integrity. Please use accurate data. Just, just don't, don't mislead people. You can mislead people. It's super rude. No, nobody likes that, and it just makes people mad. But please, please check your data. It is important. Accurate data, accurate analysis, and sharing what you've learned with others. Now, I'm not saying like you have to be perfect. It's okay to not be perfect. Mistakes are fixable. Don't show inaccurate things on purpose is my point. Um, don't mislead people on purpose. Always try to do your best to be as honest as possible. Okay, maximizing the data ink ratio. Look at what's required versus what's used. Don't add extra things to add things. Everything needs to be valuable. Make sure that you are using only what you need to be using. Simplicity is more powerful than clutter. So look at aesthetic elegance as well. Complexity is not necessarily the thing that you want to aim for. Data visualizations do not need to be complex to be good. Think of all of the different ways that you can showcase your data, your patterns, the thing that you're trying to show someone else, and think about how you can do that in a elegant and simplistic manner. Now, I will use this example um, as an example of a good data visualization. So according to Tuft, this is a map that is considered the best statistical graph ever drawn. Um, so it's a little depressing because it's losses during a war, but um, it's losses of the French army in the Russian campaign from 1812 to 1813. And if you go to the link that I've included here, um, Edward Tuft actually still a poster for it. You don't need to buy the poster if you don't want to or anything. But um, the idea is this is what he is considering one of the most sort of elegant and kind of gold standard of a good data visualization. Now, um, there are some more current examples which I have used here. Um, I also have this example from XKCD. If you don't already read the XKCD comic, you know you should. Um, but you can see that my example is the frequency with which various adjectives are intensified with obscenities. And so you can actually see how that looks there. Now, for some more examples, I'm going to be using Information is Beautiful. Information is Beautiful is a website that is basically trying to showcase data visualizations. They have excellence of words and everything. Um, so the one that I picked is the Internet of Things. So the first thing that we want to know about the Internet of Things or IoT is what kinds of things. From there is how will the things be used um, and you can see what kinds of things is going to include home tech, cities, health tech, buildings, wearables, and transports. The things will be used for business, health, home, stuff like that. What tech is involved? Um, it could be data, interfaces, networking, software, components, sensors, or devices. And then if we look at everything, we can actually see um, like some examples. So let's say, for example, devices. Um, then we might see some fixtures such as smart bulbs or smart plugs. Um, you might see some meters or monitors, so like smoke meters or fire alarms, stuff like that. Appliances are another popular Internet of Things item. You know, they've started selling washers that'll text you when your wash is done, dryers that'll text you, uh, dishwashers that will remind you, hey, don't forget to empty the dishes. Um, but yeah, so you can see that the way that they've decided to visualize this data um, is pretty effective, I think. You know, they're showing like all of the different options. They are breaking it down so you can see the main questions that you might have if you don't know that much about the Internet of Things yet. And then they show it sort of all together so you can see how things are interacting. And you can follow different paths like what tech is involved. We can look at interfaces. 
machine to machine interfaces, geotagging. So those are some examples. Um, they actually do have an overview here as well, you know, an overview of the Internet of Things. Um, and you can start exploring. You can see some of the statistics that they have with some of the different animations, the connected devices, and you can see sort of where it was starting in 2014 up until 2020. This is an older animation. Um, you can see some examples, but these are all different ways that you can share your data with others. So, you know, in the example of connected cars or connected lights, you can see the difference and you can see that based off of the visualization and there isn't sort of extraneous information in here. They're showing connected lights. They have a little image of a light bulb. You can see that how many more there are connected people, um, you know, how many people are planning to buy it, the market value, stuff like that. So those are all different examples of different types of visualizations. Now, um, I happen to pick this one because I actually did my sabbatical on the Internet of Things, and so I happen to personally find it really interesting. I also didn't really want to get into anything particularly controversial, um, but you're more than welcome to go through and see all of the other visualizations that are there. Um, okay, what makes a bad visualization? So visualizations that mislead the viewer. Now, this could be on purpose or by accident. Again, I'm not trying to say be perfect, but as much as mistakes can be made, try not to mislead people. Um, some of the popular ways to mislead people are things like hiding relevant data or um, inaccurately representing data. So, for example, if you start to cherry pick studies or cherry pick data, that's a really common thing that people will do. Because if they have a particular, so let's say, you know, um, you have person A, and they have a particular argument that they are trying to make, well, if their data doesn't sort of support their argument, instead of saying, oh, gee, maybe I should change my mind, we all know humans are very bad at changing their minds. So instead, they're going to say, well, it's the data. It's the data's fault, not me. And then they're going to start doing things like cherry picking the data, inaccurately representing the data. Um, one of the places you'll see this a lot is on different news programs and social media, especially news for social media. Um, and again, I would like to say I am not trying to get political about this. I am not accusing anybody of particularly having misinformation. I think a lot of media has an agenda and it's important to know what the agenda is so that when you look at the data, look at the visualizations, look at how they're showing their data, you can have a much better idea of why it's being shown the way that it is. Um, you know, some other examples of this are changing scale and proportion. So um, the chart starting and ending, trying to sort of lead to false conclusions. Uh, we'll also see sometimes showing too much data. So if you're trying to confuse the viewer, um, sometimes what you'll see people do is they'll try to put so much data into the chart that it's, or graph or visualization, infographic, whatever. It's really, really hard to see what the kind of goal is. And so people tend to, as a whole, humans tend to not necessarily remember where they saw the information. They just remember that they saw it. So when you think back to opinions that you have or stances that you have, you may not remember why you have that stance. You just remember that it's there. And so if you can kind of convince people to pay attention enough to remember, you know, the sky is purple, they're not going to remember that, oh, I was told the sky is purple on April 1st, happy April Fools. They're just going to remember, I remember hearing the sky was blue from somewhere and that seems pretty reasonable to me. So sure, let's go with that. And if you show too much data, that's kind of looking at it and a lot of people are going to look at it and say, oh yeah, no, well, I don't really get it, but that's probably just me. I'm sure it makes sense. So I trust them. 
Um, another common thing you'll see is if something is too complex, especially for math, um, a lot of people basically kind of get frightened and they just go, oh my goodness me, math. And um, then they'll just agree to make you stop talking. I say this having taught multiple math classes, it's a problem. Um, and so that's one of the things that will sometimes happen with bad visualizations. Um, other things, lack of context, lack of labels. Sometimes it's really hard to tell what the visualization was about and why it was made. And it's not uncommon to look at it and say like, why, but why? I have questions. Um, using the right data, but in confusing ways is another way to make a bad visualization because for some people they'll you know have this goal where they're trying to lead you to this goal and so they'll do all kinds of manipulations to get you there now some examples um so i'm specifically going to call it the cnn chart because um this was a relatively well-known example of somebody trying to manipulate data and they did it in a very poor fashion. A lot of the data manipulation um, is a little bit more on the subtle side now, but um, you can see what we're looking at is somebody on CNN decided to talk about violent crime and why it's such a big problem. But you can also see from the lovely label here, the chart is probably not going the way that you think it's going because most people read charts left to right. So you're thinking, oh, look, it started at, you know, 48% and now it's at 52%. So first question, percent of what? Um, I, that's a reasonable question that you should be asking. This is percentage of people that have had uh, a violent crime incident, have reported an incident, have been around an incident, like what is this? But the second bigger issue is they reversed it. So you can see that the violent crime has actually gone down because the chart should be read right to left. So it's looking at the October 2018 data at 52%. And then comparing it to the April 2021 data at 48%. So kind of not amazing. And then they also include a margin of error that is kind of saying that the chart means nothing. It means nothing. It's not put together well. And it's done in a manipulative way. Um, so that's an example of a bad chart and a misleading graph. Um, you can see on the right here, too much data is also a bad example. Um, you know, can you tell what this is? Probably not. And if you download my PowerPoint, you probably still can't tell what this is. This is supposed to be property crime. Um, bubble radius is proportional to individuals below poverty level, but like, could you really pull something out of there and make it reasonable? Honestly, probably not. Um, so I have another link that's examples of bad visualizations. Um, I tried not to pick any sports ball ones or uh, music any things so that nobody would cry and stop the video because I don't know what I'm talking about for either one. Um, but these are some examples of very poor visualizations with some explanations of why it's considered poor visualization. Um, so, you know, like, let's see this one. Um, so this is importance versus recognition of employee well-being and DEI at work. Percentage of companies that say employees work to support well-being and DEI is critical versus percent that say this work receives substantial formal recognition. And then um, you can see that this is kind of not really put together well, it's kind of misleading. Um, and, you know, you can see that a lot of these are kind of either misleading or confusing, or you just kind of look at it and wonder what it's about. Like this one. I, I've looked at this one several times. What is this about? Like, at, uh, I couldn't tell you. So that's some examples of very poor visualizations. Um, yeah, 
uh, this is adding in too much information. So you can see this one um, actually has uh, its own right y-axis, which if you look here, the uh, y-axis is the up and down one. So 0 to 3.5 versus 0 to 1.8. And um, you'd have to sort of have more detail to figure out why Great Britain had its own right y-axis instead of using the same one. So, um, yeah, this would be an example of a poorly done chart. So those are some things that you should really consider avoiding. Um, another example is manipulation. So in this particular case, the question is, what is this chart actually showing and what are they trying to sort of communicate here? Now, um, in this particular case, do you think that this chart is showing option one, all the people participating in the survey have tried marijuana or option two, how many people have tried pot in which year? So based on first glance, what do you think this chart would mean? Now, if you're thinking pie chart, pie charts usually end up equaling 100%. So a lot of people probably think that everybody has and it's just when they tried it. So did they try it this year, last year or in 1997? Um, but they're still kind of saying 100% of people have, which logically, if you think about it, you're like, oh, wait a minute. No, that makes no sense. But it still takes a little bit. Um, so that's another example of a poor visualization. Now, something that is important to make note of with data visualizations. Not everybody can see the data visualizations. Not everybody can distinguish colors. Um, accessibility should be something that is included as part of us communicating our data to others. Making sure that everybody can easily understand our data is important. So um, I have included a link here on defining what accessibility is, but it's important that everybody has the ability to understand and engage with materials. Um, this is data visualizations. This is UI UX. Um, and in my opinion, this is also the world around us. I think that it's important that everybody has the ability to go and do the things that they feel they are capable of doing. And the roadblocks aren't roadblocks that people put in their way. It's just, you know, if somebody doesn't have enough spoons to do something, that's fine, but it shouldn't be that they are afraid to leave their house because they are concerned that there won't be a wheelchair accessible bathroom. I don't think that's right. Anyway, accessibility for visualizations in UI UX. We have to think about to whom is it accessible, under what conditions, and for which tasks. So an example of this, for some people, videos, are awful. They maybe can't hear or can't hear as well, or they just don't like hearing things, or maybe they are really reluctant to listen to videos because they're concerned about, you know, noises hitting them the wrong way. And so doing things like having closed captioning or subtitles, which, you know, all of my videos should have subtitles for this reason. Um, so that you don't have to. If you, maybe it's something as simple as the register of my voice doesn't work for you. It hits you the wrong way. The video should have subtitles so that you can read the subtitles instead of having to listen to it. Just like if you read all of the PowerPoints, all of the PowerPoint images have alt text. And in some cases, I actually include some little Easter eggs in there um, because not everybody can see the PowerPoints. And so they have to run off of, you know, the software that will read it out to them. So it's important to think about that for your data visualization. If the only way that somebody can interact with your data is if they can physically see it, they can differentiate all colors, and they can read your really tiny text, you're losing a lot of the population, and it's worth thinking about how you can present it and include everybody in what you're trying to share. And this can be as easy as alt text, alternative versions, paying attention to contrast, um, finding other ways to represent your materials. 
but it's something that is worth thinking about. So with data visualizations, one of the things we have to think about is labeling and color or color contracts. So when we look at a lot of the colors on a data visualization, if the colors are too close in tone, somebody who is colorblind or who has low vision is probably going to have a much tougher time being able to pick out the patterns we want to share with them. So we want to think about how we can make that better. Maybe it's making sure that our text has really high contrast. Maybe it's having a recording to go with our visualization that's describing the visualization. Um, maybe it's keeping the visualization simpler or having bigger versions so that, you know, if somebody is low vision, they could actually still see it because they could blow it up on their computer or um, they could look at it section by section, something like that. Um, making sure that you're being mindful of colors, the colors that you choose matter. You know, for some people that are colorblind, it's important to not have colors that are either similar in tone or colors that people can be colorblind to and use that as the only way to communicate data because then again, you're leaving out a whole population. Think about offering different formats. So think about having recordings and videos and animations and notes and other ways that you can share the information. Try not to just show your data visualization in a single way, have other options. So that's the week 11 on data visualizations. I hope you are all having a lovely day.